All right, hi, good morning. My name is Rick Olson, and I'm one of the elders here at Trinity Church. And, uh, I'd like to welcome you all this morning. Uh, I know that by the end of today, you'll be glad you came. Uh, and one of the reasons I know that you'll be glad you came is because we are in the middle uh, of a Sunday morning teaching series called The Power to Change. Uh, we're studying the 12-step recovery program. Uh, the 12-step process has been the predominant process for recovery from alcoholism for about 60 years. Uh, but it wasn't developed by doctors or scientists. Uh, it was uh, developed out of the practices of a religious society known as the Oxford Group, uh, which believed that self-improvement came from prayer, meditation, and admitting your wrongs. Uh, Bill Wilson, a stockbroker and uh, an, uh, an alcoholic, uh, someone who's addicted to alcohol, popularized the 12-step process with uh, leaderless meetings, and in 1935, Alcoholics Anonymous was founded. Uh, today, the 12 steps is used in a wide range of recovery and healing programs, everything from uh, narcotics to overeating to codependence. I was very excited when Joel told us that he was going to do a teaching series on the 12 steps because I have been a 12-stepper for 28 years. Step, steps one through nine are what we call the production steps, and, and steps 10, 11, and 12 are what we call the, uh, the maintenance steps. So Joel has covered steps one through nine on Sunday mornings now, and it seemed appropriate to pause and sort of reflect back on, on steps one through nine. So Joel asked me to come up here and share my story as a 12-stepper. So uh, buckle up. <laughs> In August of 1987, after a night out at a co-worker's party, I came home so intoxicated that I passed out on the bathroom floor and didn't wake up until 4.30 in the morning. Now, I knew that my son got up about 6.30 and would often come downstairs and, and get his own breakfast. So it's possible that he might, if I hadn't woken up, he might have come downstairs and found his old man, passed out on the floor of the bathroom, covered in vomit, and been scarred for life. And believe it or not, this was my wake-up call. The, the fact that I might have scarred my son for life was what God used to finally open my eyes and convince me that my drinking was in fact not under my control. I admitted to my wife that she was right, I was an alcoholic, and I needed help. And two days later, I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous. That was my introduction to the 12 steps. But to really make you understand my story, I need to take you back a few years. In fact, I need to take you back almost 30 years before I was even born. My father was a foster kid. His name wasn't even Olson, it was Strain. Uh, old man Olson had died and Mrs. Olson took in a foster to generate some income for the family. Uh, and my father later took the name Olson uh, to sort of make it easier on his life. Uh, the Olsons were a legalistic Midwestern Baptist family. Uh, but with no father, uh, in my father's life, although he had this religious background, he also had no uh, male role model, except for his older stepbrothers. Well, these older stepbrothers, ironically, turned out to be alcoholics. Now, I'm not really sure how this impacted my father's, uh, I don't have a lot of insight into how this impacted my father's uh, upbringing, uh, but I can imagine that sort of being torn between uh, the legalism of, of his Baptist family and the chaos of his brother's addictions, uh, that he became quite jaded. I, it's an assumption on my part, but I, I assume that's what happened. Um, he, he never really had a chance 
he himself became an alcoholic. As I was growing up, my father was harsh and unpredictable. I spent my youth walking on eggshells, desperately trying to gain his approval, but knowing that being the object of his attention was dangerous. I might get praised, but I might get criticized. Being criticized so harshly and so often by my own father growing up developed in me a desperate need to be approved by others. I learned that I needed to control how my father perceived me in order to get his approval. And I learned how to hide anything about myself that might be perceived as negative. And as I got older, this became a style for me to control how people perceived me in order to gain their approval. And my parents brought me up Lutheran. That was my mother's background. Growing up Lutheran, I got a good education in the Bible. The Lutheran doctrine is mainline Protestant. I learned to respect God, and I came to believe that we should live our life to please Him. Interestingly, I lived with some of the same conflicting forces that my father had. I was learning about a loving God and that we should live our lives to please Him. And at the same time, I was living with a harsh, strict man who uh, taught me to fear authority and to always walk around with a sense of shame about myself. Well, I learned those lessons well. I became an expert at controlling how others perceived me. I learned to joke, hide my insecurities. Uh, I learned to use food and alcohol to control my feelings. Ironically, I then had to use, uh, I then had to hide my use of food and alcohol in order not to be perceived negatively for the way I used food and alcohol. It, it was a daunting task for a young man to try to control everything and every person and every circumstance in order to protect myself from this overwhelming sense of shame. In high school, I regularly attended my church's youth group. Uh, one Wednesday evening, one of my classmates brought her boyfriend to the group, and he said things that I had never heard before in church. He said that there were people running around who had a head trip for Jesus, but not a heart trip. He said that people, people knew all about Jesus, but they didn't know him personally. And they never asked him to come into their life and change them from the inside out. Well, that just hit me like a ton of bricks. He was describing me. I had felt hopeless that I would ever be able to live a life that would please God. But now, with his words, a small hope sparked a life in me that maybe there was a way to live that life that God would approve when we all bowed to pray at the end, I said a silent prayer. I said, Jesus, I will never be able to live the life that you want me to. The only way for this to happen is for you to come into me and you make me into what you want me to be. So please, come into my life and change me from the inside out. I was 17. I had gone from a place of hopelessness that I was ever going to be able to please God to a place of hope that maybe in the future I would be able to live a life without shame. I knew that things were going to be different, and they were. I began to engage in Christian service. In college, I was discipled by a member of Campus Crusade for Christ. He was on staff at the college where I, where I was attending. Uh, and this was my introduction to discipling, which has become a passion for me uh, for my entire life. During, um, I fell in love with a non-Christian. Uh, during the course of our relationship, she came to faith in Christ. And in fact, 
she prayed with me uh, to receive Christ as her Savior, uh, just as I had done about three years earlier. Uh, marriage seems to have, I skipped a part, <laughs> but we were married in 1978, uh, and I graduated from college in 1979. I got a job here at Lockheed uh, as an engineer. Uh, now, marriage seems to have ushered in uh, a change in me. Uh, my relationship with my wife was new, but my relationship with Christ was not. Uh, the skyrocketing growth of the years before uh, changed into more of a fizzle. And uh, my drinking was becoming a problem. Uh, my wife began to tell me I was drinking too much, but I just looked for ways of hiding my drinking from her. Looking back, it was odd that the sense of shame which a few years earlier had led me to receive Christ as my Savior was leading me merely to looking for more creative ways to hide my drinking and to, and to hide myself from the shame. Uh, it was a way for me to control the shame in my life. Uh, I thought I was being successful at hiding my drinking. Of course, I wasn't. My wife knew all about the drinking. Uh, and in fact, the only person I was actually uh, fooling was myself. It would be seven more years before that fateful night in 1987 uh, when the light would finally come on for me. Those seven years were filled with denial that I had a drinking problem, with many promises of moderation, followed by many broken promises, uh, of course accompanied with an appropriate excuse or justification. Uh, I, I want you to understand why it was so hard for me to admit that I had a problem. It was because the drinking and the controlling behavior and the hiding was protecting me. It was shielding me from experiencing the pain caused by this overwhelming sense of shame. To even think about not drinking was to embrace a life where I would have no protection from these terrible feelings. It wasn't until I realized that I would eventually do irreparable harm to my son that I began to realize that I needed to put away those self-protecting mechanisms in order to protect the people I loved. That was 1987. I admitted my drinking problem and I started going to AA. It was a hopeful time for me. I was beginning to get glimpses of what life could be like as a non-drinker. I had racked up over two years without resorting to alcohol. Then, on New Year's Eve in 1989, my wife announced to me that she was leaving me, that she was tired of living with an alcoholic. I pleaded with her. So I haven't had a drink in two and a half years. She said, I realize that you're not drinking, but you still act like a drunk. Because shame was my defining characteristic, being abandoned was the worst possible thing I could imagine happening to me. It meant that I wasn't good enough for my wife to stay with me. I was damaged goods. My hopes of living a life without shame were shattered. Even worse, I wanted to feel betrayed, but I couldn't because I knew in my heart that the whole thing was really my fault. One night, after an encounter with her that was met with cold rejection, I dropped to my knees I was crying. I said, Lord, this is too much. Take me home. This is too much for me to bear. Just take me. I want to die. Shortly thereafter, I moved to Sunnyvale. 
I began to realize that my problems were not just about my drinking. I hadn't been drinking, but I still had all these problems. Although I had not been drinking, I had also not been working the 12 steps. I went back to AA and I started seeing a therapist at the Christian Counseling Center in San Jose. A few weeks later, I found a church called Trinity. That was 1990, 25 years ago. At this point, my story takes two parallel tracks, sort of like the tracks of a train that, that proceed on down the line of my life. The one track was my Christian growth track. Uh, I was growing in my relationship with Christ. I was beginning to engage in adult ministry here at Trinity. Uh, and I uh, was, in 1994, able to, uh, to marry a wonderful woman, Linda. Uh, many of you know my wife. She's a wonderful Christian woman. Uh, it was a wonderful part of my life. The other track of my life was my recovery track, which involved the 12 steps and going to Alcoholics Anonymous. The 12 steps helped me to shed the faulty training that I'd had from my youth and to be trained in some uh, more successful life skills, so to speak. Although I mostly worked these two tracks separately, they enhanced one another and, and often overlapped. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about how it was for me to work the steps. Step one says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. Uh, after that evening on the bathroom floor in 1987, it was pretty clear to me that I was powerless over alcohol. Um, but uh, when I sat down with my sponsor to work step one, I told him that I thought I could manage my life pretty well uh, as long as I wasn't drinking. He said, well, let me see, Rick. You haven't had a drink in almost three years. How's your life? Your marriage has failed. You're filled with shame. Are you really managing your life or are you just in denial? Eventually, I had to admit that my life was out of control. My drinking was not the source of my problem. My drinking was just a very visible symptom of my problem. And we got to step two. Step two says, came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore us to sanity. When we sat down to do step two, I told my sponsor that I knew that God was almighty and that he could fix my life but it was pretty harsh to call me insane. <laughs> I wasn't really insane, I just had a few issues. He said, <clears throat> you've been trying to control every circumstance and every person in your life. You've been trying to play God. Rick, that's insane. <laughs> he said, your best efforts have led you here. And your insanity has kept you from letting God fix your life. Well, I had to work through that, but finally got through that. And I got to step three. Step three says, made a decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God as we understood him. Well, I had this step nailed. And I had received Christ as my Savior, and I had turned my life over to him, and I told my sponsor that I was done with this step. He said, you've turned your life and your will over to the care of God. I said, yes, I have. He said, so every decision you make is fully consistent with the will of God. I said, yes, it is. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> your life is a mess, Rick. Your life is not turned over. If it was, you wouldn't need recovery. That's because you don't have the power to turn your life over to God. No human does. You only have the power to make a decision to turn your life over to God. The turning of your life over is the rest of the steps. 
Well, by the time I had really finished step three, I realized that my best efforts at managing my life had only gotten me into recovery. And I realized that I would do absolutely whatever God, through the 12 steps, asked me to do, no matter what the cost. From my moral inventory in step four, through the asking of God to remove my defects of character in step seven, the steps trained me how to take responsibility for my spirit. I learned that I couldn't remove my own defects of character. Only God could. I struggled a bit with the idea that I was taking responsibility for my spirit, but that I wasn't actually making the changes in my spirit. I mean, that's kind of hard to, to rationalize. The analogy I came up with um, was actually from my job. See, I am the launch readiness lead of my program at Lockheed. Uh, I am responsible to ensure that we're ready to launch on launch day. Procedures must be written. Uh, personnel must be trained. Equipment must be checked. I don't actually do any of that work. Other engineers do it. But if I don't take responsibility for launch readiness, then we might not be ready to launch on launch day. And so it is with my spirit. If I take responsibility for my spirit, by inventorying my character and uh, let it, becoming ready to have God remove those defects and then humbly asking him to remove them, he will. And I can tell you from personal experience, he does. Amen. But if I don't do these things, then he knows that I'm trying to rely on my own strength and he won't force me to let go of my defects. You see, while I was working steps four through seven, I experienced a mind-boggling revelation. I discovered that the self-protective mechanisms that kept me safe as a child only served to hurt others and to isolate me from people as an adult the life-saving defense mechanisms of my youth had become the character defects of my adulthood. And God will not rip away my defense mechanisms and leave me exposed, even if those things are hurting me, until I'm ready to let him remove them. Working the 12 steps taught me the need to stop trying to control others and just be myself. For me, it's an ongoing process. But I need to trust God rather than the defense mechanisms that were invented by that little child. As my sponsor used to say, quit trying to play God. You're not very good at it, and the job's already taken. So now I move on to steps uh, eight and nine. In, eight, in steps eight and nine, I was trained to make amends. Making amends is a really disgusting process that has really, really wonderful results. As a person whose main issue was shame, it is particularly hard for me to go to someone and to admit that I've wronged them. It, would, it means exposing myself as being inadequate, as not being acceptable. You know the first thing I learned, the first thing I discovered about making amends? I didn't die. No matter what I had done, after the amends was over, it wasn't the end of the world. And that made the subsequent amends a little easier. The next thing I discovered was that often people wanted to reconcile, but they didn't know how. They didn't know where to start. So when I showed up with my amends, it was often a wonderful experience. Yeah, I suppose there were some attempts on my part to make amends that didn't go so well. But honestly, I don't remember those. 
I remember the amends where I got my friend back. Instead of exposing me as unacceptable, it allowed me to restore good relations with people. From the process of working the 12 steps, I found that the sooner that I make amends, the less time I spend in misery. So I've made a point of not putting amends off. Today, if I need to make an amends, I try to do it quickly for both my sake and for the other person's. One thing that <clears throat> seems to work really, really well is I make amends during a fight. So for example, if my wife and I are arguing and I get too worked up and I say something hurtful, I will sometimes st stop and say, wait, I need to apologize for that. I, I got worked up and, and I got scared and angry and I took it out on you. And you deserve better than that from me. I'm sorry. So you know what that does to a fight? It ruins it. <laughs> Because you, you can't really stay mad at someone who's trying to apologize to you. So that's an example of how I continue to practice the 12 steps in my life today. Twice in the past 25 years, um, I've realized that I was struggling with a particular stronghold in my life, and I did the entire 12 steps over again just to address that particular issue. Now, I'm not perfect at this. It's a journey, and it's one that I will be on for the, my entire life. I don't drink today, but that's really a small thing compared with what God has done in my life through the 12 steps. The 12 steps have taught me to let go of my need to control people, places, and circumstances, and to rely on God's love and care to lead me through this life. 